Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell from Hasslefree cashflowinvesting.com. Very special guest today, uh, Terrence Robinson from the National Football League. And uh, welcome, Terrence. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Thank you very much. I have had the pleasure of knowing and working with Terrence for a couple of years now. And uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend who played with the Oakland Raiders. And uh, Terrence and I really had a great chance to talk about business, talk about life. And I really thought his, they or do think his story is just really inspiring. And I wanted uh, Terrence to get the opportunity to tell his story. Um, and he's a great public uh, speaker and uh, really love to see him getting more and more opportunities to speak and just very impressed uh, with him. You know, I, I would say most people on our call today know who I am, but just in case, uh, I'm a real estate developer, syndicator, and I love teaching. I, I used to be a high school band director and then, you know, had such success in, in real estate that I was able to retire from being a teacher and become a real estate investor and entrepreneur full time. And I love giving back. And that's one of the things I really admire about Terrence is when you first uh, think about, you know, someone who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Atlanta Falcons and the Seattle Seahawks, someone who's a really impressive uh, athlete who has that kind of uh, physical prowess that can be very intimidating. It's nice to also see that he's got a very uh, intelligent brain and a great heart. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's got a great mind for financial planning and real estate investing. The father of three and uh, loves being a mentor uh, and, and uh, helping out. out. Um, so Terrence, I'm so happy uh, to have this opportunity to do an interview today. And I think... You know what? I, quit. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, I think the number one thing that people are kind of curious about is what's life like in the NFL? I mean, you, you get so much celebrity and fame overnight and uh, money too. And what's that like? How do you, how do you deal with that kind of uh, a change in your life? You know what I tell you, David, uh, starting out, it wasn't easy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it wasn't easy because, you know, I come from a small country town in Texas by the name of Tyler, Texas. And, you know, we're talking a place of about 85,000 people. Uh, you know, 100,000 people, if you can squeeze, you know, the, uh, you know, the population from the outskirts of Tyler. But, um, you know, then I went to, School at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and so once again, you know, you migrate into a smaller town, a smaller community, and uh, you know, it was extremely hard transitioning to Pittsburgh, uh, where I started my uh, in my professional career at. And uh, you know, I tell you, the hardest part is uh, not trying to keep up with your Heinz Wards and your Jason Gildens at the time, and your you know your Kendrill Bells, and these are these guys that you know, have these multi-million dollar contracts and, you know, you're trying to keep up with these guys, you know, in reference to, uh, you know, learn a lot from them on the playing field, but also outside of the playing field, it's, uh, you know, these guys driving these extravagant vehicles and living in these luxury homes, uh, you know, and it's it's really hard not to, um, uh, not to try to keep up. But, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, it was, it was mind boggling uh, at first, but, you know, I've also, I've always been extremely humbled in which uh, my mother played a uh, tremendous role in, uh, you know, raising my brothers and myself. Uh, amongst myself, I have the oldest brother, Terrell, and then I've had a younger brother by the name of Tony. But, you know, my mom played an intricate part in, uh, you know, in us, uh, you know, being well-grounded and being humbled and, and uh, you know, being very thankful for the things that we have and, and uh, you know, what we, what we are live for. I had the pleasure of talking with your mom on the phone, and she is an amazing woman. And one of the things that uh, resonates about you in all areas of life is you've got an amazing sense of self-discipline and self-confidence. How did you go from being in a small town in Texas to being in really the, the pinnacle of professional sports? How did you make that kind of growth? 
Well, you know what, I'll tell you what, it all started with, uh, with my drive and, and determination. Uh, I'm an extremely p determined and confident individual, and anybody that you speak to that knows me will tell you that. Uh, you know, Terrence is the type of individual that feels that he can make water run uphill. Uh, I'm that confident, although we know it's not true, but uh, you know what, I got a lot of it from, uh, you know, just from, you know, once again from my mom, and, and uh, you know, for me it was, uh, you know, my mom taught us how to set goals. Um, she structured, uh, you know, everything in our lifestyle when we were young, so it would prepare us for uh, the real world later on down the road. And, uh, you know, for me it was setting goals. Um, I remember playing uh, football and as a freshman in high school, and I was actually went to a private school for two years and then transitioned from a private school to a public school. And so, you know, I had the opportunity to see in both worlds from a small school standpoint and then also seeing it from a large school standpoint. And what I learned, you know, from both was, uh, you know, being able to set goals, creating a structure, and then most importantly, uh, I call uh, learning how to get past your comfort zone uh, in life. And that's, you know, when you're working out in football, you're working out in basketball or sports or anything in life, and, you know, you get to a point where you initially want to stop, uh, you know, it's being able to mentally prepare yourself to uh, – uh, to go past that, that what I call comfort zone. And so, you know, goal setting and um, and uh, personal development, you know, played a huge role alongside of you know, my mom raising us the, the right way. Yeah, your mom's a motivating woman. Do you have any other um, mentors that uh, either that you knew in real life or maybe their books or their, or their audio programs that you digested that really played a big part in your personal development? Yeah, you know what I do, and I'm going to tell you, um, as I was playing in um, Atlanta, this was 2004, I had the opportunity to uh, meet an individual by the name of Basil Alabashi. Uh, and Basil was actually here in Denver, Colorado. And uh, the thing I liked about Basil was, you know, he's an extremely successful man uh, business-wise. He's also extremely successful when it came to uh, real estate, but you know, he was also a godly man. And, you know, for me, I really didn't have, you know, a father figure to, uh, you know, help me make it through life. You know, especially being a young boy, uh, you know, being a young successful man, you know, in sports and school. And I really didn't have that figure to guide me and, you know, didn't have that phone call to where I could just, you know, pick up the phone and say, hey, Dad, this is what's going on in life. You know, how do I transition from it? And so, uh, you know, Vassal pretty much took on that role. And, uh, you know, i tell you what. He, um, you know, he uh, inspired me to get into financial planning, and, uh, you know, that's where I got my financial planning background. And as I transitioned into financial planning, you know, the one thing that, uh, you know, he taught me was, you know, dedication to my clients and dedicating to, uh, you know, people who I worked with. And so, uh, you know, as I began working in the financial planning industry, what I learned was, you know, relationship building was key, you know, relationship building. Uh, you know, whether it's friends, family members, you know, individuals that you network with, it really didn't matter. It was just relationship building was extremely influential in, you know, me having success in financial planning. So, uh, you know, Russell, you know, he played an intricate part, an intricate role in, in my success in the financial planning industry, and now he also uh, mentors me in, in all of my business. Uh, when you've got a, a, an impressive background like you do, I, I'm it's sure it's easy to, to use that background to build relationships with mentors. But when you're first getting started and you're kind of a, a nobody from Tyler, Texas, how did you build relationships with mentors? And what kind of advice could you give to someone who's just starting out in anything in life where they really want to build a mentor relationship? How do you find one and how do you groom that relationship? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, in reference to building relationships, I did a tremendous amount of networking because you know, I came into a coal market here in Denver, Colorado, you know, in the financial planning industry where I didn't know a single individual. You know, also at the same time, you know, I'm working on a 100% commission-based industry. And so, you know, I figured I had to go out and, you know, it's just like, you know, going out and tackling a running back in the backfield or going out and dropping back in coverage and intercepting the football. You know, I had to go out and, you know, key, you know, you know, people that were very influential, you know, in the community, you know, whether they were, you know, I consider them centers of influences, but, 
you know, whether it was an attorney or a doctor or, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a pastor or a preacher or a priest or whatever it may be, you know, I started with, you know, uh, you know, keying on, you know, centers of influence throughout the community because these are individuals that, you know, I felt if they have any influence, if there's anybody that's got any influence in anybody's lives, you know, it's these individuals. And, uh, you know, so I started at that direction. You know, I started with the, um, believe it or not, I started with uh, my attorney. And as I transitioned my attorney, he introduced me to uh, his CPA, and I started working with his CPA and then other CPAs. And, and uh, you know, it just, my, you know, my business just took off from there. Uh, and then, you know, in reference to your second question and, you know, helping young individuals understand the importance of, uh, you know, wanting to be successful and having a drive and wanting to, uh, you know, do something. I, you know, I, I use an analogy. You're probably not going to think I can spell, Dave, but it's called uh, cash. And that's K-A-S-H. And K is for knowledge. A is for attitude. S is for skill. And H is for habit. And so what I had realized that, you know, knowledge is something that comes over time. You're not just going to have it overnight. Attitude, you either have it or you don't. Skill is, you know, fairly similar to knowledge. You know, it's something that, you know, just it comes over time. It comes with experience. And then, you know, have it, once again, it, it, it correlates with attitude. You know, it's something you either have or you don't. And so... You know, what I would always tell these young individuals is, you know, as long as you have the attitude and you have the proper habits, the knowledge and skill will come over time and you'll most definitely have success in anything that you do. I love that uh, acronym. I, I heard that acronym from you, Terrence, for the first time. And I, I want to do a, a great plug for your Facebook uh, fan page, um, sure. facebook.com slash Terrence Robinson 30. That was your player number. and. Uh, sure. I, I love getting Terrence's uh, status updates. He posts some very inspirational thoughts, including that cash concept that uh, you just shared. And I encourage everyone just add, add Terrence to your your, uh, your Facebook feed, and uh, you'll get some great inspirational thoughts throughout the day. So thanks for sharing those. Absolutely, absolutely. So how how do you approach goal setting as, as an athlete? You know, first of all, most people in life don't set goals or if they think they set goals, you know, they're so vague or they have no um, measurability to it that they aren't really goals. So how, how do you approach goal setting and what kind of advice can you give everyone uh, on our call today about how they can use goals to become successful? You know what? It all starts with the mindset. Uh, and, and once again, it, it goes back to you know, attitude, you've got to have the right mindset in anything that you do, whether it's, you know, sports, whether it's business, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, being a father, you know, whether it's being a husband, you know, it really doesn't matter. You've got to have the right mindset in order to be able to approach, you know, goals because you've got to understand that, uh, you know, you're always going to be faced with adversity and, you know, it's how you persevere through that at those adverse moments because there's, Especially starting out in something, it's always going to be those at first moments that make it difficult for you to persevere. But, uh, you know, I always approach goal setting with one thing in mind. And, uh, you know, the most important thing for me is, you know, making sure that, you know, I stay focused on the task at hand. And, you know, for financial planning, it was, you know, making sure I catered to my parents, I mean, to my clients and to the, my clients' needs. You know, in business, it's, once again, making sure, you know, I cater to my clients and, and my clients' needs. And, you know, what a lot of unsuccessful individuals and business owners uh, run across is, you know, they don't really listen. You know, they don't really listen to their clients. Uh, you know, they, they don't keep track of, you know, their clients and, and their clients' lives. And to me, you know, either in, even in real estate investing, you know, all of my clients are, believe it or not, are very, very great friends. And, you know, I've learned to understand that, you know, if I can, you know, help an individual, uh, you know, by helping them attain my own and uh, of their dreams, if I can help an individual by, you know, helping them, uh, you know, purchase a life insurance policy or disability income policy, then, you know, I think the reward is, is uh, you know, tremendously um, you know, outrageous for them, uh, you know, just because they're able to take the selfish acts and the selfless acts and, 
and uh, most importantly, be able to adequately align their actions with the value. Yeah, that was interesting. Something you said uh, earlier when we were b b before our call, you were talking, telling me a story about when you were 22 and just the amount of forethought that you had and compassion for your family uh, and, and purchasing life insurance at an age where most people think they're invincible. Uh, sure. tell, me, tell me about being 22 years old and, and having <laughs> the self-discipline to, to really set a financial plan. Well, I'm going to tell you what, it wasn't easy. <laughs> and it wasn't easy for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, I was young and had my first son, um, Ty, who's, who's now nine years old. And, and um, as, I, as I had Ty, I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be able to, to adequately align my actions with my values. And this is something that my mother has always, you know, taught my brothers and us growing up is, you know, you've got to be able to align your actions with your values. And, you know, when your actions don't align with your values, then the structure of your life is just not going to fit everything else around it. And so, you know, for me, it was making sure that, uh, you know, I once again took, you know, my selfish acts and, and made them more selfless and and uh, went out and purchased a life insurance policy. And, uh, you know, I had a gentleman that approached me and had asked me, hey, uh, you know, I noticed you just had a young a young son, you know, it's a beautiful young son. I'm actually, you know, walking around in a Walmart in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and I'm, you know, hugging and kissing and holding on to my son before I go to camp. And this uh, gentleman asked me, hey, I noticed you got a young son. Uh, you know, would you be interested in purchasing a life insurance policy? And, you know, I, I didn't even second guess it right away. It was, it was yes, absolutely. And uh, so he sat down with me and you know, right away he starts talking about a million dollar life insurance policy. And you got to understand, being 22 years old, you know, it's kind of like I thought I was getting a million dollar check, but my eyes were rolled in the back of my head. And I'm like, this guy is talking to me about purchasing a million dollar life insurance policy. I figured all I needed was a 25 or 50 thousand dollar policy. So, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, long story short, I ended up purchasing the policy, and uh, you know, after purchasing the policy. You know, once again, transition into the business from where I, you know, I still have the policy, but you know, also have been able to, uh, you know, do some things for my kids that you know, I think will play intricate parts in their growth as they get older. You know, for them to be able to understand the importance of, you know, saving and putting money back, and most importantly, taking care of the family. Yeah, that's fantastic. When you were um, in the NFL or even in your role as captain of the Oklahoma State University football team, did they give you formal training in goal setting? And what would that look like? You know what? I'll be honest with you, they didn't. And I was extremely fortunate. Uh, my senior season at Oklahoma State, I had gotten an opportunity to go to Orlando, Florida, and play a major role in a leadership conference in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I was picked um, one of 20 out of several thousand student athletes in college. And um, so, you know, I had the opportunity to go to Atlanta and participate in this national leadership conference that they host every year at the NCAA uh, level. And, you know what, I got to be honest with you, that helped out tremendously, uh, you know, just because of the things that I learned at the leadership conference but most importantly, from the relationships that I was able to develop at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It must be a big change, a big transition, going from uh, being a college student to earning millions of dollars a year in the, the or earning a lot of money in the NFL. And did sure. your, how did your lifestyle change? Uh, change when you went from basically being broke to basically being able to buy whatever you wanted to, to buy? How do, how do you handle that kind of change in life? And how do most people in the NFL uh, make that change? And how are you different? Sure. Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my lifestyle didn't change at all. And um, the reason I say that is I had a, uh, you know, a mentor that played in the NFL with me. And you know, the reason, you know, he mentored me uh, is because, you know, our, our families were extremely close and we pretty much grew up about 15 miles away from uh, from one another. And so, uh, you know, he was on his ninth year in the NFL and, uh, you know, he kind of taken me under his wings when I went to Atlanta. And, uh, you know, as I got to Atlanta, you know, I, I was 
telling you earlier, uh, I actually went out and purchased me a uh, 1989 Chevrolet Capri for 2,500 bucks, and then I also lived in a um, about a $60,000 condo here in uh, Denver, Colorado. And uh, you know, the one thing that he he taught me was, you know, you gotta eat in the off season, and so essentially. You know, what that meant was you don't get paid in the off-season. So the money that you're making in season throughout the 17 weeks that you're playing football, you know, you've got to do a great job of, uh, of preserving that money and saving that money and making sure you can make it those several weeks in the off-season. So, you know, I lived on a very tight budget. Um, didn't spend a lot of money at all. I didn't um, take a lot of vacations. I... Uh, you know, we're extremely fortunate to have the support of my family and my girlfriend, Christy, and, and uh, you know, from Christy's parents. Uh, they, uh, you know, were extremely supportive in, you know, in everything that we did. And we also understood that, uh, you know, the NFL was an extremely, um, let's say, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't concrete for me going free agent. And so, you know, there was no doubt in my mind not knowing, you know, if I had my job tomorrow, you know, I had to make sure that I made the proper decisions for me and my family. But for other guys, I will tell you with the experience that I had, you know, throughout Pittsburgh and throughout Atlanta and throughout Seattle, uh, you know, I and you see it in the news now. Uh, you know, I actually just saw recently, several months ago, where, you know, the world renowned uh, one of the top, you know, agents out there in sports, uh, you know, filed for bankruptcy. And, you know, this is an individual that you've got, you know, a lot of your marquee guys, and I guarantee you, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't deal with an individual if they don't go in the first round. But you know, this is a guy that, you know, a lot of these guys are putting their trust into, to, uh, you know, to help them preserve their money, you know, like myself. And you know, he's he got this, this same individual that's filing for bankruptcy. But alongside of that, I mean, you see your Warren Saps and your Latrell's free will help throughout these other sports, and these guys are struggling because of, you know, these hawks were coming in and, and uh, you know, trying to take advantage of them at, at an opportune time. Do they give any kind of financial training when you uh, are in the NFL and they give you your first check? And it's probably the first check for a rookie player is probably more money than they've made in their entire life. And sure. is there any kind of training that goes along with that? It seems like handing a kid a loaded gun and saying good luck. <laughs> You know what? They do give you training, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, David. Um, uh, you know, the NFL does play a huge role in trying to make sure that, you know, the training that they give you will help you to, you know, transition in life to the changes that, you know, you're faced with. But, you know, you and I both know that at the end of the day, you can lead a horse to a well, but you can't make them drink. And, and uh, you know, so a lot of the training that these guys, you know, get from the NFL, you know, it's kind of like, it you know, goes in one ear and off the other, if that makes any sense. So that's why, you know, you see the problems with, you know, you've got, you know, 80, 85% of guys, when they come out of the NFL, you know, they're, they're within a certain time frame. I don't know if it's three years or five years, but within a certain time frame, these guys are broke. Yeah. You, you said something very powerful earlier, that you've got to be able to eat in the off season, and that... Sure to me as a real estate developer because I'll develop yeah. a project and make lots of money and then it might be a long long time before I get before I'm back in the season of development again and right. so it's it takes a lot of discipline to live below your means and uh, to really mm -hmm. invest for um, uh, for dividends as well as for capital gains because those dividends help sustain you in your off season, whatever your off season of life uh, would be like. Uh, for me, Absolutely. you know, I, I didn't get that lesson when I was young. So I had a, a boom and bust cycle in my life. And, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, on one hand, I wish I didn't have that kind of a, a bust failure. But on the other hand, yeah. it really created a sense of discipline and thriftiness and uh, uh, and endurance and, and just kind of tempered steel that now uh, sure. I really know what a, a problem looks like in life. And uh, so when you deal with kind of day-to-day -day noise, it, it doesn't really bother you, right? So sure. Sure. How, do you, how do you deal with uh, 
failure in, in life and, and how do you pull yourself back together? And maybe if you have any stories about just dealing with adversity. Well, you know what? Um, I tell you, I'll be honest with you. And, you know, you just, you know, stated that one of life's best teachers is trial and error. And, you know, I learned it in business. You know, I started out and, and uh, you know, really thought that, you know, I wanted to, you know, be in a certain business. And, you know, as I got into that business and, and bumped my head along the line, uh, you know, bumping my head for me was more, you know, uh, financial troubles and, and not necessarily going broke, but it was actually losing money on jobs and learning, you know, all the factors that are associated with, you know, looking at a job. And so, uh, you know, for me, I learned early that, you know, in order to be successful, you know, some of the best lessons, you know, throughout life come through trial and error. And, uh, you know, so for me, you know, I just kind of, I'm going to be honest with you, David, I, uh, you know, I, I shake it off. You know, I, I really shake it off. And, uh, you know, my mom used to always tell us that, you know, people may doubt what you say, but they will always believe what you do. And I can just picture my mom's face. And I can picture my mom's finger, you know, as she's pointing at us and saying, but remember, always, always, always believe what you do. And, and uh, you know, so, you know, whenever I come across, uh, you know, a stumbling block, you know, I just kind of, I look at, you know, some of the things that, you know, I learned from that stumbling block. Most importantly, you know, what did I do? Uh, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And most importantly, how can I feed off of both of the things? How can I feed off of what I did right? And then uh, how can I feed off of what I did wrong? Yeah. You know, well, fact of life in sports, there, there's a, a winner and a loser in every game. So I, I'm guessing even though you're, you're a world-class athlete, you've lost your fair share of, of football games. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I probably, I'm probably one of the most competitive persons you'll ever know. But uh, you're right. I had to learn. I was, I was, I was the sore loser. Uh, but, uh, you know, I really had to learn how to uh, – how to lose first and foremost, and as I learned how to lose, you know, I told you it it, uh, you know, it, just, it really helped me with uh, with business and, and most importantly with life. You know, a lot of times too as well, David. What a lot of people don't understand is uh, you've got to you've got to know yourself. Uh, you've got to know yourself, and you've got to know the person that you are. Uh, and if you you know take a situation, let's say uh, uh, someone comes to you, David, and uh, and uh, they say you're an African American. Well, you and I both know that you're not an African American by any means. But you know, how do you take you know someone telling you that you're an African American? I mean, do uh, you know you just look at them and say, hey, you're extremely crazy, or you know, is it something that you really take personally? And you know, the individual that doesn't know himself, or most importantly, him or herself, and most importantly, uh, are going to take it personally. And, and, uh, you know, that's what a lot of people feel that is really knowing who they are, who they're, you know, who they're in self is. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. I mean, you, you could internalize uh, someone's critique of you, of, you, of you or, you know, if it's true, accept it and let and grow from it. And if it's not Correct. true, you just have to move move on and, and don't let that sure. internalize the way that you your inner monologue is so important. Uh, and sure. And how do you filter out um, all the noise in your in your life so that your inner monologue is is taking you to the place that you want to be? You know, well, once again, it all starts with mindset, and then and, and secondly, it's you know it's individuals that I hang around. It's uh, you know I, I I try to associate myself with positive, influential individuals, and and uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, my mom is my number one mentor, and and uh, you know whenever I you know, come across issues or, or, or I'm having great times in, in my life throughout the period. And, you know, I always call on my mom. And regardless of what the situation is, uh, whether once again, it's either going great or it's going bad, uh, you know, my mom can, can most importantly expect a call from me. And so it makes it, you know, very easy when you have the right um, support cast, you have the right individuals and in your life and, you know, people who are going to be supportive and, uh, you know, people are always going to, 
you know, be positive with what you have going on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's being able to, you know, make a, you know, negative, you know, situation a positive situation and, and uh, you know, understanding how to deal through the uh, those adverse moments. Yeah, you said something that is just so true that you surround yourself with positive individuals. And when you have that positive peer group, everyone has momentum to move forward. And when you surround yourself with a negative peer group, it, the same thing happens. And I, I really applaud the people who are taking a part of their life and investing it in uh, this program today because you're associating yourself with a positive peer group. You, you can do it in real life and in personal interaction, but you can also do it virtually. You know, one of, one of my great mentors is uh, the late Jim Rohn and Zig Ziglar, who mm -hmm. we lost this year. And uh, both of those gentlemen lived in my car in a CD. And every day in my car, as I was driving to work, I'd listen to Jim and listen to Zig. And uh, that kind of positive influence on my life uh, really is a big part of who I became. And then started seeking out uh, mentors. And sure. once you get to a high level in your business, it's very hard to find those uh, that peer group locally, right? It's hard to get a yeah. group that are physically or geographically close to you to associate. And that's why it's so great to have uh, the internet, to have email, Facebook, um, conferences that you can go to. And if you go to a great conference, you know, there's a big filter that's already filtering out all of the people in life who didn't believe enough in themselves to invest in that type of an experience. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you left the NFL uh, and, and entered the world of business, how, how did that transition impact your, 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 just the way that you thought about life and maybe the way that you handled your money? Well, you know what, um, you know, it all once again started with uh, a mindset and I actually had prepared myself to transition from the NFL. And the reason I did so is I actually went three different teams three different years. And understand, you know, at the same time, you know, I've got a young, uh, uh, you know, when I was in Pittsburgh, it was a newborn at the time, and, and I've got a family. And, uh, you know, I looked at it, you know, hey, I'm making a lot of money, and I'm not spending a lot of money. But my desire to stay in the NFL is just not as great as my desire to, um, you know, want to be a father for my son, want to be a, uh, you know, a boyfriend at the time or a husband to Christy. And so, you know, I decided to uh, walk away. And I got to be honest with you, I remember I went to work out for Buffalo and after I had finished working out with Buffalo. I had a great workout, and there was about five guys that were working out, and, you know, they were looking for someone to come in on the special teams and you know, replace an injured player, and, uh, you know, when I got finished with my workout, I talked to the, uh, the linebacker coach at Buffalo, and he just kind of told me how great my workout went, and, and you know, pretty much they were going to look to uh, give me a contract. Well, I called my agent after I had spoken with him, and, you know, I told my agent, you know, Kevin, I um, I think, um, you know, I don't want to play football anymore. And, you know, he was at awe because, once again, you've got to remember, you've got this competitive individual like myself. And uh, not only am I competitive, but I love the game of football. And so at first he was in awe. And so the first 30 seconds was like, you know, what do you mean? Well, you know, what's going on? What do you mean? And, you know, initially after that, you know, he came to understand that, hey, you know, he just, you don't want to play football anymore. And the reason I made that decision, David, is because, you know, I spent about 11 and a half months out of Ty and Christie's life, you know, between uh, mini camps and OTAs and training camps and, you know, flying back and forth to a team here and there for a week or so. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't want to do it. I wanted, really wanted to play a huge role in my family. I wanted to play a huge role in being a father uh, to Ty. And, uh, you know, and so I uh, decided to walk away. And when I decided to walk away, I looked at myself in the mirror when I was in Buffalo after taking my shower. And believe it or not, I started crying because it was, 
you know, I knew I was going to walk away and I knew I wasn't coming back. And so, uh, you know, I called my mother first and, you know, got my mother's blessing. And then I called Christy and Christy was also in shock too as well. Um, but, you know, she also supported me and, and decided that I was done. And, um, uh, you know, it was the best decision I think that I made ever in my life because it was the toughest decision that I ever had to make, uh, you know, walking away from something that you love so much and something that you cherish so much, uh, you know, and, and wanting to be with my family. But you know, it also helped my growth, uh, you know, as being an entrepreneur and also being a, 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 a you know, a, a man, you know, to, uh, you know, be a part of my family and be a part of my family's life. And, and believe it or not, the business aspect was just simple. Uh, it was just going out and competing in business and doing the same things that I did in football, but, you know, only having so much control because I didn't have the knowledge and I didn't have the skill, but I had the, the attitude and, most importantly, I had the proper habits. And, uh, you know, it was just a, you know, it was just a process. I love this story because you made a decision that your actions needed to be consistent with your values and what? started with your family values and decided what was most important to you. And when your actions are incongruous with your values, life doesn't feel right. Sure. And uh, sure. For you, most uh, for you to, for you to have recognized that and walked away from something that, uh, most people in the world would uh, do anything to get what you had and uh, for you to walk away from it for your values is uh, a very powerful thing. Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. <laughs> By no means necessary was it easy, but, um, you know, after, you know, deciding that I was going to do it, you know, it was, it was done. You know, I, once again, you know, I made that phone conversation to, uh, my, with my mom and, and with Christy, and they both blessed me and, and uh, said, I support you in any way. For Christy, it was, okay, what are you going to do now when, when you come home? <laughs> and, uh, and, and for me, it was, you know, it was an easy decision. You know, also, Dave, I'm going to say, you know, if, if, if you're on the call and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you know, if, if you know me personally, if you want to say anything, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, to write something on the call. That way we know you're there. And, uh, you know, most importantly, that way we know you're, uh, you know, you're involved and you're in tune to uh, what's going on. And, you know, I know, you know, you know, I greatly appreciate, you know, the time that, uh, you know, you guys have taken to uh, listen to this call for I think that, you know, we all can learn a lot from it. But, you know, most importantly, you know, we all have extremely busy schedules. And, you know, and for people that are extremely close to me, you know, I greatly appreciate you know, you taking time to listen in on this call. So if you got anything to say, if you got any questions, feel free to fire away. One of the questions I asked uh, Terrence early on is to really identify his strategic resources in, in life. And when we look at strategic resources for most people, we look at cash, cash flow, equity, and credit. And for a traditional financial planner, those are all the resources they can work with. And as someone who really is a creative investor, especially in the world of real estate, uh, Terrence and I can work with people's resources that are what we call below the line. So the above the line resources of cash, cash flow, equity, and credit, a deal needs those for sure, but they also need time, talent, strategic relationships, building your team, managing your team, and then control of deal flow. You know, ultimately you could have all the resources, but if you don't have a vehicle to invest that in or a deal to invest it in, then the other resources can't be activated. And so um, one of the great things is Terrence's relationships in the NFL give him an amazing amount of strategic relationships, both existing and the ability to get into future relationships. You know, I, I used my position as a, a high school band director, having very, very successful high school band programs. It gave me a position of influence, a sphere of influence over a community. And using that sphere of influence uh, to get into relationships is, is a very powerful thing. Uh, Terrence, do you have any thoughts about how you use these eight strategic resources in your investing? 
Yeah, you know what? I think, you know, with, with the resources that I've been able to utilize, understand, you know, having the experience and, and being able to say that, you know, I had a chance to play in the National Football League, uh, you know, to be able to say that, you know, I was a, a captain on my, you know, college football team at a major Division One college, and, uh, you know, just to be able to utilize the resources, you know, especially the strategic resources, you know, uh, amongst, you know, the, the National Football League and, you know, Oklahoma State, too, as well. I mean, uh, you know, I've been able to capitalize on, once again, uh, you know, being able to put a lot of things to the table with real estate investing and, you know, also with my other businesses. And, and uh, you know, I think these resources have, have been extremely influential in my success, you know, whether it's, you know, the Vassal Alabashi or, you know, it was, uh, you know, a lot of my great friends are also still playing in the National Football League now. Great. Do you have any, uh, uh, we're, we're open to questions if there's any questions from our audience. And uh, Terrence, do you have any final thoughts for uh, someone who is really aspiring to greatness in any field? And uh, what, just some, some motivational thoughts to help someone uh, get from where they are to where they want to be. You know what, I, I have to say, you know, this is a perfect time of year because, you know, as you're transitioning into a new year, um, you know, this is a perfect time where, you know, I'll take one day and it's typically, you know, on a weekend and I will, you know, just mind map. And so what I've done is I've been able to, uh, you know, mind map. And uh, what I mind map for is I mind map for my goals for the upcoming year. And what you have to do is it's kind of like working on your relationship with, you know, your significant other. You know, I think, you know, what a lot of, where a lot of people have trouble in relationships nowadays is, you know, you're not on the same page as your significant other. And you guys don't sit down and really talk about, you know, what your goals are most importantly for one another, but also what your goals are for a family. And, you know, I, I call it, a, you know, a relationship retreat or it's, you know, it's like a retreat with your significant other. And so, you know, what I do is I, uh, you know, I mind map for a day and uh, I, you know, set my goals for the upcoming year and all my goals are based around, uh, you know, personally, professionally and financially. And, you know, with me setting my goals in those three different categories in my life, uh, with mind mapping, it allows me to be able to, uh, you know, visualize where I'm trying to get to most importantly, but, uh, you know, also understanding where I'm going to as well. Yes. So, you know, any, any, any closing, any closing words I would most definitely say, uh, you know, don't be afraid to set your phone aside, turn the TV off, uh, get a piece of paper, uh, you know, find a mind map software on the computer, or find a mind map software on your uh, you know, your iPad or your, your Samsung Galaxy and, and my map and, and set goals, you know, personally, professionally and financially. And if you have a significant other and you're going through some troubling times in your relationship, I'll tell you it's the best thing that I've ever done with Christy. And what we do is, you know, we'll take at least three days off and, and, uh, you know, we'll go on a relationship retreat. And this retreat has evolved around us talking about our goals for one another uh, for the following year, but it's also uh, based around us talking about our goals for the family and for the children. And you have to do the same thing for yourself individually and for your businesses too as well. That's a very, very true statement, Terrence. And a lot of people are potentially scared to really delve into serious goal setting with their spouse because something could come up in that conversation where there is a non-alignment of goals between their, their partner. And sure. some people are kind of uh, uh, secretly afraid that if they really get into goals with their, their, their partner, that, uh, that, that could create an issue in their relationship because they don't want uh, to the same things out of life and they don't want the same things Correct. out of a relationship. Um, Correct. But it's so important to do, and just work with your partner, work with your spouse on creating a safe environment where you can uh, externally process your thoughts without having uh, 
to commit to them. You know, that's something that I, I work with uh, in my marriage is uh, I, I'm an external processor. I, I like to come up with an idea and talk about it and talk about it. And at the end of talking about it for 20 minutes, I might say, that's a terrible idea. Let's do something else. <laughs> And my wife is an internal processor. She thinks and thinks and thinks. And by the time she opens her mouth, she already knows exactly what she's going to say and exactly how she feels on the subject. So when she hears me talk about some crazy idea, you know, initially she thought that that's really what I meant. And it isn't what I meant at all. I just needed to kind of a, a process. I needed to di dialogue with someone. So I think that's one of the first things when you're working with your spouse on goal setting, figure out if they're an internal processor or an external processor. And uh, is it a safe place where you can talk out loud or whether you need to come up with your ideas and really know how you feel about something before you introduce a, a new topic? Correct. I agree. Yeah. Uh, we do have some good questions. So uh, from one of our uh, attendees today, uh, Terrence, when things are not going the way you want or the way that you think they should, how do you stay positive? Give me one second, Dave. Sure. So I'll, I'll answer that while Terrence is. is uh, no, you know what? This is, uh, I'll be honest, uh, and this is what I do. Um, I look at you know, where I've come from in life. And, you know, I look at, you know, all the things that I've gone through. And for me, you know, I always keep a visual of, you know, where I'm heading. And so for me, keeping positive is, you know, it's, it's a form of life for me because I've made it my livelihood. You know, and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, you hear people say, oh, I'm going on a diet, I'm going on a diet, I'm going on a diet. Well, you've got to understand, you know, it's not necessarily going on a diet, you know, being healthy, eating the right things and exercising is a lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, you've got to, you know, create a lifestyle for yourself to have the proper mindset, you know, to be positive. And so I'm always 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 positive now, i'm gonna tell you what it, it is not an easy thing because you know you you do come across adverse times but uh you know staying positive you know throughout those negative situations you know it uh you know it just makes life so much more easier it does absolutely uh, i the way that i implement that in my uh life is having a compelling reason or a compelling why is what I call it. So what my compelling why is can be very articulated. So when times get tough, I look at what I'm working towards, what my goal is. And if that goal is, it's, it's the magnetic power of the future. I know what I want my future to look like and I'm not yet there. So by articulating where I'm going and what I'm going to do, it's it, that force just pulls me forward, pulls me, pulls me closer uh, it pulls me closer to that result as, uh, as well. Sure. It me through that, that funk. The other thing is from the great Jim Rohn, he says, uh, six, you know, in the Bible, there's six days of work and one day of rest. And that day of yeah. rest is hugely important. You know, Jim Rohn says, even God had to rest on the seventh day. So yeah. give yourself some rest. You know, it, it's not, seven days of rest and one day of work, right? But we, we call Correct. it sharpening your saw. When you're trying to chop down a big tree and uh, you get discouraged, you know, sometimes you need to stop and have a sandwich, have a drink of water, sharpen your ax, and then get back to chopping that, that tree. You can't just whack at it with a dull, dull ax forever. Speaking of it, you know, and you bring up the Bible, there's a verse in... Second Thessalonians, and, and I apologize, David, I do not know exactly uh, which verse it is, but there's a verse in Second Thessalonians that says, be joyful always, pray continuously, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's gift for you in Christ Jesus. And uh, if you want to get that verse, I mean, you can email me. My email is, is there at the bottom of the webinar. But I, I tell you what, um, on the uh, screensaver on my phone, 
uh, that's what it says. And, uh, you know, being positive, that's, believe it or not, that's, that's how I stay positive, is being able to, you know, look at uh, that verse and say, wow, um, be joyful always, pray continuously, and give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, it just takes a lot of the headache away. Oh, thanks. That's great. We've got another question from one of our participants. Uh, because you, Terrence, are uh, very knowledgeable in traditional financial planning and uh, in life insurance, and you've got a family, how do you use life insurance for your kids? And do they have their own policies? Or um, just how, how do you use life insurance with children? You know, that is a very great, great question. And uh, I'll tell you what. Um, my kids do have their own life insurance policies, and uh, these policies are with um, uh, mutual companies. And um, one of my kids' policies is actually, and this is my nine-year-old, his policy is with uh, a company by the name of Northwestern Mutual. And then uh, my other two sons, uh, their policies are with a uh, company by the name of Guardian. And the reason I like mutual companies is because, uh, you know, their fees are low. And so you, you, they're not trading on the stock market. And so, you know, you look at a company that's trading on the stock market. When you go to, uh, you know, the back end and you see what their fees are and you see how much of your premium dollars are going towards, um, uh, you know, your, your, what is called cash value in these particular policies, then uh, you'd be amazed. And so, uh, yes, my, 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 my sons, they all have, uh, a traditional whole life insurance policy. So uh, this isn't a term policy. It isn't a universal life policy. Uh, you know, this is a traditional whole life policy uh, that has cash value in it. And, uh, you know, what I utilize these policies for is, uh, you know, the cash value first and then the death benefit second. Uh, I, could, I could do a webinar alone just on traditional whole life policies. But, you know, the one benefit of these policies is, you know, you're able to lock in their insurability at an early age, also at a healthy age, plus they're able to purchase more death benefits at a later attained age and, have, and not have to prove uh, insurability. So, uh, you know, if my kids having these policies, uh, they can purchase more death benefit, you know, when they're starting out when they're 23 all them, and up until they're 40. Uh, and they don't have to show insurability. So if my son has a heart attack at, you know, 27 years old, he's still able to purchase more life insurance. Yeah, I have a very similar strategy. You know, on my my life and from my wife, we have term insurance because if we die, we lose our income. And Correct. for our my son, we have a cash value policy or a whole life policy, and that mm -hmm. whole life policy is an asset for my son. It's growing over time. Um, that death benefit, death benefit really for our son is just to allow his mother and I to, to have some grieving period in life. Um, sure. but hopefully, you know, he lives longer than his parents and that uh, policy you know, gains, becomes an asset for him. That he can uh, borrow against that cash value or, or use that cash value as an asset uh, in the future. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. This is a great webinar. I'd like to encourage everyone, uh, again, to become a fan of Terrence Robinson's Facebook page there, facebook.com, Terrence Robinson 30. Also, we do webinars like this on a regular basis. I encourage you uh, to visit my website, hasslefree, cashflowinvesting.com. There are a bunch of educational resources there for you. It's all uh, designed to help you become a, a more connected investor and be more successful as a, a, a investor and as a business person. And uh, I want to say thank you very much to Terrence for taking his time um, for being on Absolutely. the call today and providing some amazing thoughts for us. No, thank you very much, David. I really appreciate the call and, and, and for all of y'all who are on, uh, thank you for getting on and taking time out of your business schedule to get on to as well. If you've found great value in this video, I really encourage you to, uh, if you're watching this as a video, click like on YouTube. If you're watching this live, uh, please come to our Facebook page and share your, your thoughts, share your our discussion you know, after this uh, video so that we can 
you know, kind of get some good interactive feedback going through Facebook. Also, please, this video is going to be posted up on our YouTube channel and on my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. I'll send everyone on this call a, uh, a link to that video and encourage you to share it with your family and friends uh, so they can get the same uh, benefits and joy that you receive. If you're looking for investment opportunities or uh, financial uh, mentorship, uh, feel free to reach out to Terrence Robinson or myself via email or both. And I really appreciate everyone's time.